I've got permission to read you a couple of extracts from a letter sent home to his dad by a US Marine major in Ramadi. Uh, his job was to try and set up local government and get the Iraqi government infrastructure up and running again and get the Iraqis to understand that they have to set up governance of their own. Um, I'm reading this too, firstly because he's telling the truth. I don't agree with everything he says, but secondly because these are, these are quotations and all his letters are the same of remarkable eloquence. This guy writes like Joseph Conrad and you will not read this in the Washington Post. We are trying to empower the Iraqi police to walk with the Marines, but the graft has not yet taken. There is something culturally childish in their understanding of basic Western governance and management that will require immeasurable education and probably several generations to overcome if they find it of any interest. That education is, of course, a choice that they have to make on their own. They are not our people. Our understanding of their tribal governance and its relationship to formal civic management is equally naive and charges our frustration. The problem now is that every inconvenience has become our responsibility. They act as if they cannot comprehend our sacrifices and are thus ungrateful for them. The reality is that they cannot culturally comprehend our altruism or believe our stated intentions. Even though it is not their desire to offend, we are insulted and it bleeds us of affection and tolerance. Liberation will compete with invasion as our legacy, but locally we are ideologically irrelevant. Our presence is mostly only of interest to those who seek to benefit from our contracts and donations. It is a region of people making alliances, business deals, friendships and enemies one day at a time without a real concept of sustainable services, resources or trust. No future. Just daily survival as they know it, family and tribe. Our contributions may be counted long after we have withdrawn, but they will not recount the names of our fallen, so many now. Each wound will be absorbed into the quiet sadness that we allow to pass beneath us as a people and a country. Our loss will have never even occurred to most people here. But if you think this is a guy who doesn't have a sense of humor, listen to the next bit. He's talking to his dad, remember. So what news about the new government, you may ask? Well, the provisional military governor was replaced by the transitional governor who resigned under threat and was replaced with another transitional governor. He was then replaced by the emergency appointed governor who has just been replaced by the selected governor chosen by the elected provincial council. He never made a speech or publicized his views, never debated the other candidates and was not present during the selection, never making an acceptance speech. He was promptly kidnapped by a rival tribe while his tribe fought another tribe on the Syrian border. The recently displaced emergency appointed governor then returned in hopes of regaining the position. However, the deputy governor is now serving as the acting governor while the actual selected governor is in captivity. <laughs> but there was an election, so democracy is in full bloom, I am to understand. <laughs> we are now trying to force the power of decision <laughs> onto the elected provincial council and the city officials. It is a difficult thing to keep myself inactive. Um, in matters of governance here. The instinct to impose order and command the requisite discipline in the Iraqi leadership must be quelled in order to allow sovereign stewardship to develop at its native pace and in a native form. I fight myself to remain insignificant in the process. I haven't the nature for passive observation. I share the American fascination with action and it has consistently betrayed us in our foreign policy. Our continued involvement will continue the state of dependency, and our eventual departure will leave nothing but cosmetic structure here. Iraq will return to what it is. Our common sense is not common to this people, and that understanding must be given proper respect. I do my best, but I twitch with an urge for the folly of intrusion. Now that is what I call eloquence, and you won't read that in the New York Times, and you won't read it in the British or the French press. This guy knows what's really happening. This is your eye tonight into Iraq. Will you leave? Um, the Americans must leave, the Americans will leave, and the Americans can't leave. And that is the equation that turns sand into blood. I've been saying over and over again for the last two years, in America, giving lectures on the East Coast, West Coast, <coughs> Midwest, forget about Iran. Try and get your mind off Iraq. There is one Muslim nation, which is packed with Taliban supporters and Al-Qaeda supporters, and it's got a bomb, and it's called Pakistan. And then we're surprised when the Marriott Hotel blows up.
and now we're going in on the ground. Another country, hence my Iraqistan um, parallels. You know, even when we are faced with our enemies, we don't pay attention. Um, every time Osama bin Laden makes another of his long and admittedly usually very tiresome audio tapes or videotapes, same way it's always treated by the press. Is it bin Laden? Is it still alive? When did he make the tape? Um, has he got kidney failure? And does the CIA confirm it's his voice? We never actually listen to what he says. General Montgomery at the Battle of El Alamein, October 1942, he had General Irwin Rommel's picture in his caravan because he wanted to think inside this guy's brain and he read everything that Rommel or Hitler said about North Africa. And we don't. We don't care. We don't listen. Here is Osama bin Laden on a tape on the 13th of February 2003, just before our invasion of Iraq. Now, the point about this is that he is talking about, this is the detonation of the insurgency which started immediately we arrived, because the Brits were kind of, we hadn't run away by then, well, now we have basically, back to an air base in Kuwait. But he was telling here, and I'll explain what I, what I know he was trying to say, he's telling Muslims in Iraq that you can cooperate with even ex-Bath Party members against the new Crusaders. This is the way in which Al-Qaeda and the Sunni insurgency, and indeed Shiite insurgency, would come together. And he refers here at one point to how the Crusaders um, accepted help from Persia. Uh, not the Crusaders, the Muslims accepted help from Persia against the Crusaders. Because in those days, Persia was not um, an Islamic country. It was Zoroastria. Here is a bin Laden. It is beyond doubt that this Crusader war will be first and foremost directed against the family of Islam, irrespective of whether the Socialist Party, he means the Ba'ath Party, and Saddam survive or not. It is incumbent on Muslims in general, and specifically those in Iraq, seriously and in the manner of jihad, to roll up their sleeves against this tyrannical campaign. Furthermore, they are duty-bound to accumulate stocks of ammunition and weapons. They did. Despite our belief and our proclamation concerning the infidelity of socialists, he means Ba'athists, in present-day circumstances, there is a coincidence of interest between Muslims and socialists in their battle against the Crusaders. Socialists are unbelievers wherever they may be, be it Baghdad or Aden. Aden is in Yemen, where bin Laden came from, of course, originally, his family. This fight that is taking place today is to a great extent similar to the Muslims' previous fight against the Christians. The coincidence of interests is beneficial. The Muslims' fight against the Christians coincided with the interests of the Persians and did not in any way harm the companions of the Prophet. This is the most important thing bin Laden said prior to our invasion of Iraq, and we didn't even read it. I was in, I, I was in America, and I was in Beirut, and I simply Bob didn't bother reading it myself. How many of you here remember reading anything about this in the Post or the Times or the LA Times? No. Certainly not on CNN or Fox, that's for sure. All you got was that little image. Is it him? Look, there he is, gone. You know? and, and, and there's something, I wonder sometimes if 24 hours TV doesn't produce this amnesia in all our political leaders. In Britain too, and in France and all, well, France actually came rather well out of that. Uh, many people in Britain said that President Chirac was representing them because Blair didn't. Um, I have to say that my newspaper, The Independent, and my editor calls it a views paper, not a newspaper, which is why he tolerates me going around America talking like this. But the fact of the matter is that our paper actually printed a map of the anti-war march route so that our readers could take part in it. But, of course, our politicians didn't care. And now the press has become the parliamentary opposition in Britain because the Tories joined in the war. But how we, I can imagine how we might start negotiations with the insurgents, because we will, just as the French did with the FLN. The first thing we have to do before we start those, well, I know there already are talks, actually, in Jordan, but the first thing we need to do before we face the thought that we're going to have to talk to the people who will take over Iraq is that insurgencies are not fought primarily to get rid of the occupiers. They are fought to establish the right of the insurgents to rule the country afterwards. The FLN did not primarily fight the French in Algeria between 1942, uh, 1954 and 1962 because they wanted the French out. They knew that if they kept fighting, the French would go. The FLN fought to make sure that they would run Algeria when the French left, and they did, and they still do. And the insurgents in Iraq are primarily fighting all the different groups, not to get the Americans out because you will leave, just like you will leave Afghanistan, where more than half the country is now in the hands of the Taliban. 
during the day as well as the night. But we must understand that the insurgents of Iraq are fighting, not Al-Qaeda, that's a different thing, the Iraqis will take care of them, are fighting primarily to establish their right to have a role in the governing of post-American, post-occupation Iraq. This we do not think about. We only think, they want us out, we've got to fight them. Terrorism, 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 terrorism. Terror, terror, terror. Name one newspaper ever, every day, that doesn't have the word terror in it. It terrorizes us. I know it does to the other people. I'm sort of misquoting the Duke of Wellington there. What did he say to his soldiers? I don't know if you frighten the enemy, but by God, you frighten me. That's what I think now when I see these Western convoys going past me in the Middle East. But another major problem is going to be how this is explained to you, the American people. How are you going to be told that we're getting out? I've noticed in the last two years, three years actually, in small American papers like Denver, uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, how many people here have been to Cedar Rapids? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just acre and acre of wet beet fields and railroad yards. But anyway, in the local papers, I've noticed letters popping up. And they're sort of saying, what are we doing sacrificing ourselves to these people who just want to kill each other? Why should we be bringing the benefits of our civilization, the fruits of our human rights and, and democracy to a people who don't understand? You see, this is, again, the Arabs, you know, they're a bit untermenschen, you see. And I noticed on the same day, here's David Brooks in the New York Times. He's been reading British history of 1920 in Iraq. A bit late, didn't read it before, but he's, he's getting around to it. The British tried to encourage responsible Iraqi self-government to no avail. Well done. And then he carries on, today Iraq is in much worse shape. The most perceptive reports talk not so much of a civil war as a complete social disintegration. And then he goes on, the latest dissent, of course it's um, caused by American blunders, but primarily it is exacerbated by the same old Iraqi demons, greed, bloodlust, and a mind-boggling unwillingness to compromise for the common good, even in the face of self-immolation. Civilization was supposed to have begun out here in Iraq, remember, at Samara and other places. Iraq is teetering on the edge of futility, whatever that means, and then it will soon be time to effectively end Iraq. It will be time to radically diffuse authority down to the only communities that are viable, the clan, tribal sect. And then here is uh, USA Today, Ralph Peters, the very same day as David is writing in uh, the New York Times and giving us the fruits of his wisdom. Here is Ralph Peters, former US serviceman writing in USA Today. He was, uh, was pro-invasion, uh, as of course was Brooks. I was convinced that the Middle East was so politically, socially, morally, and intellectually stagnant that we had to risk intervention or face generations of terrorism and tumult. The country's prime minister now has thrown in his lot with al-Sadr. The police are less accountable than they were under Saddam. He's got that bit right anyway. Our extensive investment in Iraqi law enforcement only produced death squads, quite correct. And then he goes on, for all our errors, we did give the Iraqis a unique chance to build a rule of law democracy. They preferred to indulge in old hatreds, confessional violence, ethnic bigotry, and a culture of corruption. You see the way this is going, don't you? Arab societies can't support democracy as we know it, and people get the government they deserve, and poor old Iraqis. But it's their tragedy, not ours. Iraq was the Arab world's last chance to board the train to modernity, and CNN and Fox, no doubt, to give the region a future, not just a bitter past. The violence staining Baghdad streets with gore isn't only a symptom of the government's incompetence, but of the comprehensive inability of the Arab world to progress in any sphere of organized human endeavor. We are witnessing the collapse of a civilization. If, he's got this bit right, if they continue to revel in fratricidal slaughter, we must leave. This is the message you're going to get more and more in the, in the weeks to come. Whoever by the way, becomes the next president of the United States. Nothing, I promise you, is going to change in the Middle East. Then he goes on, you see, there's always a note of optimism, hope, of some kind, however obscene. Here is Ralph's message of hope. We'll still be the greatest power on earth. Indispensable to other regional states, such as the Persian Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, watch out, Saudi Arabia, that are terrified of Iran's growing might. Here's the old narrative again. If the Arab world and Iran embark on an orgy of bloodshed, the harsh truth is that we may be the beneficiaries. 
think about that for a while. Haram, as they say in the Arab world. Poor old Arabs, you can't have said. When you read that, 